just you get to choose. Right? Like here's here's the scenario: the, the environment gives us something which can be perceived as negative, can be perceived as not working, can be perceived as problematic. The world's ending. So we get to choose to see it like that, or we get to see choose to see it as an opportunity. So clearly, that it's my responsibility now to do that for other people. If I have information, and you know, other people's success is my success, and vice versa. Because you know what, like the challenges or the roadblocks are the journey themselves. There's no big things. It's all little things compounding on top of each other. Welcome to another episode of the Pro Advisor Coach Podcast. We welcome Greg Smith as a guest. Uh, Greg is a financial service professional with over 50 years of experience. He started his career in commercial lending and earned a CPA certificate while at a national CPA firm. He also served as managing partner of a FINRA member firm in Minneapolis, engaged in M&A and private placement transaction for three years. Over the past 15 years, Greg has been a registered rep with several FINRA member firms, which led to joining Rainmaker Securities. 28 years, Greg has held C-level positions in banks, bank holding companies, airlines, chemical companies, insurance, and real estate and fleet finance entities. He has served as chairman of boards of directors of public and private companies and has successfully managed over $1.5 billion in buy-side and sell-side transactions and numerous private equity placements. Greg is effective in business turnarounds, recapitalizations, and management restructurings, and has led numerous mergers, acquisitions, debt placements, and equity capital placements. He also wrote the Amazon number one bestseller, No Locked Doors, Master the Keys to Transform Problems and the Possibilities. And Greg and his wife, Kate, have been married over 50 years. They have four grandkids, Ava, Cooper, Everett, and Sebastian, effectively known as the Four Aces. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Josh. I'm happy to be here. Well, that was uh, a mouthful makes it seem like a negative thing, but there there are, are so many experiences in your, your business background. I almost don't even know where to start. Um, I know that we talked about your core principles and tenets and perseverance being one of those. So maybe I'd like to start there. What does that word mean to you and how did that become part of uh, who you are? Well, that's a good question. Perseverance is really the, the, the core principle of the book, uh, which is to find that strength from inside uh, and, and really never giving up, uh, plowing through, following through, uh, finding the answers to problems, embracing problems, embracing challenges, and, and solving them. There's, there's no greater feeling than solving a problem before you that's been a real challenge and getting through it and working through it, however you do it. Uh, so yeah, perseverance to me is, is very important. I'm still persevering. I'm 72 years old and I'm still persevering. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and that was going to be my question. How, how has that princi principle evolved or changed or uh, turned into something different over the years? And how do you apply that to what you're doing today? Uh, uh, my clients and my friends, uh, many who are the same, uh, know me as someone that won't give up. So if we'd engaged in a transaction, um, which I'll come back to for me is really more about relationships, but in our business as investment bankers, they are transactions. Uh, our practice uh, as known as a practice that does not quit, does not give up, does not walk away. Uh, and I don't believe there's any engagement that we've ever taken on, which we weren't successful in one way or another to either meet or exceed the client's expectations. So we tend to work in challenging uh, engagements. We tend to take on engagements that others would fly over and not pick up. Maybe they're a little more challenging, a little more difficult. Maybe the economic environment is, <clears throat> is too challenging for many investment bankers to take on, but we'll take it on uh, if we think it's a worthwhile project and if we think it's a worthwhile client. And I have the good fortune of being one of the few investment bankers that you'll talk to that has actually run a business. So I know about financing. I know about debt. I know about the stress of owing lots of money to banks in challenging and, and ever-changing economic conditions. And uh, our practice knows how to work through those kinds of things. So yes, we do persevere. And I love that about the business side. And we we're just talking off camera before we started recording about uh, another thing that's really important for 
how people might decide to do business or maybe even how you decide with uh, who you want to do business with. Can you speak to relationships and how important that is and how you make these decisions? Sure. Um, investment bankers, again, typically approach uh, their business as one of evolving transactions, getting the deal done, whether it's buy side, sell side, raising capital, whatever it might be, and then getting paid on the success fee. That's basically what the, what the core principles of investment banking are about. But we try and extend that a little bit deeper and build a relationship with the client and sometimes with the constituents of the client, which might be the officers of the company, the board of directors of the company, could be the employees of the company, vendors, clients of the company, because there's a broad range of constituents. And we think about those constituents when we take on the engagement to be sure that we meet all of the client's expectations, which are varied. And we can't assume to know what they are unless we really dig down and understand them. That enables us to really broaden the relationship. So it's more than just a transaction. Now we have a personal uh, we have a personal relationship and a mutual interest in everybody pulling on the same rope to get something done. But I have found that these relationships bring me more transactions. So we've had several clients uh, that go back to the late 1990s, early 2000s, <clears throat> that will walk in the door 20 years later and ask, where is Greg? Uh, we've got another transaction. We've got another challenge we need to take on. And uh, Greg may not be behind that door any longer. Maybe Greg has moved on. Maybe Greg is in Minneapolis or Greg is in Arizona or Greg's running a different company. But uh, we'll get the call. We'll find out what it's about. We'll revive and revive the relationship. And um, we've, had, uh, we've had several that have worked out that way where we've done two or more transactions, if you will, but for a warm relationship. Mm. So not only are you getting results by persevering and, and seeing things through that you say you're the, that you're going to do, but people remember you. And that's what I think of when, when, you, when you just shared what you shared 10, 20 years later. That's, that's crazy, right? Decades later, they, they remember you. How, how do you, and this would be you know, a question that I have, but also audience members might want to know. How do you make yourself memorable when you're in these interactions and, and business dealings? Uh, is it the actions that you take? Is it what you say? Is it how you connect? Are you, are you going out for drinks afterwards with people and making those connections? Like, how do you make yourself memorable here? Yeah, it's not so much about going out for drinks and going out for dinners because that's that's what everybody does, right? So we just make it a habit to uh, maybe communicate and over-communicate with our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to ask more questions, deeper questions, uh, if, if an engagement is really done well, uh, the hard part, the hard part is done up front in, uh, discussions with the client about what their real goals and objectives are, which obviously are a financial outcome of some sort, but many times, uh, things are overlooked like the continuity of the employees. Will the officers be retained? Will the identity of the company continue? Will it be merged out of existence? What's the importance to the owner of legacy? Are there legacy issues? Um, will he have enough cash after taxes to do what it is he wants to do? Did you think about the tax complications? Are we leveraging the transaction to get the best tax outcome? Can we get Uncle Sam to help pay for part of the transaction? Uh, and again, because I've run businesses and I've dealt with the sales and purchases of businesses, of businesses that I was running across different industries, we're very adept and flexible and nimble at knowing what kinds of questions to ask and, and uh, probably a little deeper than most investment bankers are willing to go. They're running to the transaction to get the deal done, sold or bought. Uh, we're maybe a little more cautious in trying to find the right buyer, the right set of circumstances and the right form of currency because there's many forms of currency for a seller if it's a seller engagement. Is it cash? Does he want stock? If he takes some of it in stock, can he defer the taxes? Will that stock get a double bounce or a triple bounce in the future if it's a publicly traded stock or currency? Is he willing to carry a note? Is he selling the company on terms? Is he going to stay with the company? Is he going to have an earnout? I mean, all those variables before we ever get started are very important for the, for the seller to understand. Sometimes the seller thinks we're trying to talk him out of the engagement. <laughs> because his brain is blowing up. He hadn't thought about all these things. But we, no, one, no one so far has, has been talked out of selling the company. <laughs> gotcha. maybe, yeah, that, maybe, however, maybe selling it differently than what they thought, however. Uh -huh. 
That's well, going to be my observation with all those questions. That sounds like it's coming directly from your experience, right? You didn't know to, to ask all those questions or to be aware of all those things at some point in your career. I'm wondering if there was a, can you point to something that would be like a turning point, you know, 50 years experience. Uh, I take it. This is just my observation that you could probably come into any um, opportunity now and know that even if you don't know the answer right away, there's nothing that's going to stop you. You'll, you'll help the client achieve what they want to achieve. You know, the questions to ask, can you remember a point where you didn't have that confidence or was there a turning point to where everything kind of clicked into place? Uh, do you mean Josh, the confidence in, in, in asking the right questions or I'm not, I want to be sure I, I understand what you're, what you're getting at. Yeah. I'm glad you asked because it's kind of a combination of confidence and competence. And did, did those things go hand in hand or maybe which one came first for you? Uh, well, I'd have to say competence had to come first in order to be confident in giving clients advice because they're going to take that advice and go to the bank with it. And in a, in a regulated environment, which we're often working in, governed by the FCC and, and, uh, and rules of the, of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, we have to be very, very careful what kinds of advice and counsel that we'll give to a client. Uh, in a securities transaction, meaning a securities transaction, a buy side, a sell side engagement or raising capital. So, yeah, if we aren't competent, uh, then we shouldn't be confident. So uh, that that competence, at least speaking for myself, uh, comes largely from having affected transactions for uh, ultra high net worth families whom I've represented for the better part of 30 years across the, many of the various industries that you referenced earlier in the introduction. And having seen a lot of things that can go wrong and having engaged myself as a C-level executive of a company, uh, perhaps on a sell side where a major Wall Street in, uh, uh, investment banking firm was engaged and see the kinds of mistakes that people make. And we won't mention names, but I mean, it's great to have those big brands and the big fees that have to be paid to go along with it to affect a transaction. But uh, it gets down to the competence of the individuals that are working on the account. And if they bring in the B team or the C team uh, to work on a transaction that's maybe undersized for a major Wall Street firm, uh, the results can be disastrous. Uh, I even had a senior partner with a major unnamed major Wall Street banking firm completely blow a sell side transaction uh, of a company where he assumed that uh, the company was a C corporation, meaning that the corporation paid taxes, when in fact it was a pass-through entity or a subchapter S corporation. Mm. So there were no taxes and in presenting the company to buyers completely misrepresented the company. And this was done by, I'll say probably the third largest banking firm on Wall Street. So we had to disengage quickly, take mm. the company mm. off the market, let it rest for five or six months, during that period of time, the economy changed, not in a favorable way. Uh, we suffered a, probably a, 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 a 15 to 20% reduction in price because the economy shifted in that short period of time, but we brought the company back out to the market in a proper way, representing what it was and not what it wasn't uh, and getting it sold. But uh, yeah, everybody makes mistakes, but uh, there's another old adage that I picked up and it's referenced in my book from the governor of one of the uh, states here in this country who said, inspect what you expect. And I mm -hmm. tell people that all the time, inspect what you expect. Don't assume and don't take for granted just because somebody's got a lot of credentials behind their name and they work for a big box firm or a big brand firm that they know what they're doing because mm -hmm. they may not. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a very interesting situation. I wrote down something when you were speaking. You said, I've seen a lot of things go wrong. So that's just one one example, right? There's probably many others of things like that. And I guess that, that's where the competence question came from is I'm sure you learned a lot in that experience and the other ones. How much is things that go wrong, how much does that play a factor in gaining competence? Um, things that go wrong many times our gifts. So they teach us something. And hopefully things go wrong in one way or another only once and you can manage your way again so that doesn't happen. But I think uh, knowing how to deal with um, uh, uh, surprises, 
uh, disappointments, people that let us down, um, people who change their mind, uh, people that uh, uh, maybe have a change of heart uh, along the way of a transaction and you have to shift. Uh, and people who have a change of heart could be a bank, could be a lender, uh, could be a, a loan agreement that's just about ready to go. And the board of directors has a shift in policy, or maybe the FDIC showed up at the bank and said, mm, you've got a high concentration of this type of loan and you shouldn't be making any more of those loans and you get a withdrawal. Now what? So yeah, now what? Uh, now what is a question I'm often having to answer the question. Now, what are we going to do? Greg, now what are we going to do? So, yeah, experience, uh, experience is, uh, uh, has paid off immensely uh, for me. And I had the good fortune of working with um, uh, some great uh, wealthy families uh, that were dealing with uh, not only uh, founders, uh, but the execution of transactions on behalf of their successors and members of the family. And uh, gosh, it wasn't my money, but every day I treat it as if it was my money. And uh, risk management uh, is, a, is a big part of success, not necessarily risk avoidance, but risk management, knowing what you're getting into and knowing how to get out of it if things go badly. So, um, yeah, those are great lessons. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, mistakes or mishaps can be gifts. I think that's, uh, that's so crucial to, because there's so many things out of our control that happen, right? And we, in business, but in life as well. So I think that's just a great lesson to, to live by. It's, it's one thing to say it too. It's another, another to practice it. Does it take a certain number of repetitions, do you think, to get good at that? Or are you good at it? Would you like to get better at it? Uh, I would say I'm good at it. Am I great at it? I would say that I'm always learning. I mean, every day I wake up with expectation. I wake up with enthusiasm. I'm anxious to see what the day will bring. Uh, I'm still engaged in, in business every day. Um, and uh, I'm learning something every day. So getting to know people, building on relationships. Uh, you know, a successful entrepreneur likes tough questions and mm -hmm. likes to try and solve tough problems. And and uh, I've I've worked with many great entrepreneurs in my in my career, and I've 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 seen them deal with situations that were quite significant financially, affecting many times the lives of lots of other people. And uh, those are great teachers. Mm. What what motivates you now at this point in your career? Uh, I think the same things that motivated me when I came out of school in 1972, and that is curiosity. Mm. I mean, I'm just yeah. interested to see what the day will bring and, and, and what the challenges will be. Um, I'm, sp I'm spreading my time, you know, a little differently than I, I, I was 50 years ago uh, with uh, children and grandchildren and, and the expectations of, of, of my time and the time I want to spend with my family. But um, yeah, when it gets back to client relationships, it's, it's basically the same. And we just had a call here a few weeks ago from someone we sold a business for a number of years ago, um, 2002, I believe it was. And we were asked to uh, step in and, and help out and provide console and, and to be a resource for another sell side transaction. So, yeah, the world keeps turning and we try and turn with it. And it's ever changing, right? Because we can't assume that things will always be the same. They're always different. They're always going to be different. Which is maybe why you've adopted curiosity as a, a great skill, because there's always something new, right? There's always, always something crazy to deal with. Yeah, for sure. How, I'm wondering, I, I know how uh, close you are and how you feel about your grandkids. How have they helped that curiosity muscle with you? I'm curious. Uh, that's interesting because uh, I try and lead by example, and I try not to tell my grandkids to do anything unless they're in harm's way. Obviously, I'm going to you know, pull, them up, pull them away from a, a speeding car or something like that. But um, I guess I try and challenge them to think about things that are important to them and why. And, uh, you know, at different levels, presently they're four, eight, 11, and 13, and they're interested, their, their interests are varied. So they're interested in, you know, one thing or another, depending on which one we're talking about. 
Mm. But uh, yeah, I love them dearly. And I think that uh, uh, the best is yet ahead for each one of them as, as, as long as they are true to themselves and uh, are um, uh, confident in uh, where they uh, are at the moment, at their respective ages. And I think most importantly, uh, the thing I've tried to teach them, Josh, as have their parents, my two daughters and my two son-in-laws, is self-esteem. That mm. no matter what, uh, they are worth it. They are important. They are important individuals, uh, no matter what the circumstances are. Uh, hopefully, they will have great, uh, successful lives, but along the way, they will make mistakes uh, and there will be challenges and, and mistakes are okay. And we need to move on from mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes. But if I didn't have people working with me that were understanding and forgiving and recognizing that we won't make those mistakes again, we wouldn't get very far. Mm-hmm. And I and I implore empl- employers to to consider a little benevolence in working with their employees who maybe make a mistake from time to time and be just a little more tolerant. And I think we need a little more tolerance with, with uh, businesses. Now, some mistakes obviously are, are horrendous and cannot be forgiven and <laughs> we need to deal with those, but that's why there are attorneys, you know, and that's, why there, that's why there's the federal government. So we can turn them over to the federal government. But I think, uh, yeah, most mistakes are unintentional and, and uh, can be addressed if we just are honest and open with communication and, and deal with it at the time. Mm. Deal with it at the time, not kick the can down the road, but deal with it at the time. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It, it's a, a conversation and topic that's near to my heart. I run a youth hockey program and uh, constantly around kids. And they, they, they just they teach me so much, you know, as I'm instructing them to remember certain mm-hmm. things that I've either forgotten or. You know, we just get so caught up in, um, I think it's, it's, you know, I'm sure they're grateful. If not now, they will be that there's somebody like you that gives them that grace and that space and has seen so much in life, um, both personally and professionally to know what levers to pull, you know, to, to give them the confidence, but also to, to like, I think you started by saying to think about, what did you say? Think about things that are important to them. Is that how you said that? Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. yeah speak more and, of that. Why, that are important important to them and why they're important to them. Mm. You know, I think kids, it's easy for kids to get uh, caught up in uh, momentum and inertia and what are their friends doing and what are their friends going? Where are their friends going? And what do their friends have to say? Um, Sometimes our friends are not our best mentors. Mm. So uh, a a child is, is, is uh, never too young to start thinking about what's really important to them and why, and not to get kind of caught up in what everybody else is doing to, to think about what they should be doing, what they should be thinking about. Why are they worth it in terms of their self-esteem and their personality and and their self-consciousness about who they are and and what they, uh, what they want to be doing, what they should be doing. So Mm. I, I hope I hope my four grandkids can figure all that out along the way. So far, they've done an amazing job. Each one of them. Yeah, we'll that's see. awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So what what's next for you? What's what's on the docket? And uh, I know that you just got back from a vacation. I actually like to hear about that. Uh, maybe a, a takeaway from that vacation or that that experience. Maybe we should call it. But uh, what's what's next for you as well? Um, well, uh, for the trip, I would say uh, one of the most impressive things I saw was the architectural work of, of uh, a gentleman in Spain by the name of Gaudi, who was an architect at the turn of the century and created some amazing uh, architecture. And the only way he could have done it was to think way outside the box. Mm. So my takeaway of, of one of the many things I saw while I was traveling from Bergen, Norway, uh, all the way to Barcelona by 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 boat by ship um was the work of uh, gaudi and the lessons that gaudi uh, teaches which is maybe to look at things a little bit differently so that has to do with perspective and and to respect that few people look at the same thing the exact same way or read this read a story and interpret it the very same way and uh, this particular individual looked at uh, issues and he, his perspective was quite different than anybody else could have imagined in terms of what he came up with in design. So I would encourage, you know, if people want to see something really interesting is to look at the architectural work of Gaudi in, mm-hmm. in uh, Spain. And a project that he started at age 25 
uh, will probably uh, not be completed uh, in less than 150 years or longer. And it's in Barcelona. And, uh, and the successors of his are carrying the project on because at the ripe old age of 76 years old, he was run down by a streetcar accidentally oh, in no. Barcelona. And the work wouldn't have been finished in his lifetime anyways. Uh, but uh, I won't tell your, your listeners what the work is, but if they check it out in Barcelona, they'll find this project that I had the opportunity to go up into uh, by elevator, uh, the, the, the highest towers of this particular building, uh, to find out that the elevator did not take passengers down except for emergency. So it was 421 steps to get down. And uh, I walked it. I didn't run it. <laughs> as, far as, as far as the future goes, um, uh, Josh, I think, uh, for me, more of the same, uh, I do try and hit the gym five or six times a week. So I try and stay healthy. I mean, I'm, I'm only going to be around as, as, as long as I'm able to take care of the body. So, you know, I encourage everybody to eat right, get da- daily exercise and, and, uh, and, uh, help that helps, I think, to keep our mind fit if our body's fit. And uh, yeah, to support my 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 partner uh, who now runs our business, he's referenced in the book, uh, Zach Cease, and he's in Scottsdale. I'm in Minneapolis, and as and when we need to, we shuttle back and forth or wherever our clients are, because our, our clients are rarely in either of those two places. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just loving what I'm doing every day. That's awesome. Uh, one final question for me, um, and I asked this for personal reasons, but people might be interested as well. Sure. Uh, a secret to staying married 50 years. That's pretty awesome. You don't see it. You don't see it a lot nowadays anymore. Uh, yeah. Some it's sort the same of person. <laughs> yeah. I should have specified. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah piece of person. advice or observation or secret or, you know, just something you could share um, about, about being married 50 years. Uh, well, on a lighter note, uh, I'll say, first of all, two words. Uh, that have saved my marriage over 50 years. And those two words are, yes, Kate. So uh, (laughs) you might have to modify that in your own life if you're not married to a Kate, but the word (laughs) yes goes a long ways. Um, I married someone who um, I had known for quite a while in high school, but never dated. And uh, in college, never really saw her. She went to a different school. And we got together after college and we got our careers started and we kind of reacquainted and refreshed our relationship. And that turned out to be a rather short period of dating and then and then uh, deciding that we had mutual interests and we got married. Uh, kids came about three years later. We have two kids. So I think there's um, uh, many parts to a successful marriage, but I would say um, the two parts that I would focus on uh, in answer to your question are one, being a good listener, being a respectful listener, listening with authenticity, uh, listening in a genuine way. And I would say that's true, Josh, in, in business and in any other relationship that we have with anybody. So I'm just putting that out there in general, it's the biggest problem that we have in the world is that people are not, I shouldn't say it's the biggest problem in the world, but I will say in business and in family relationships, people are horrible listeners, but they're just horrible. And if we can become good listeners and and listen with authenticity, uh, people will start to trust us. And that's Dale Carnegie 101, read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, 1934. You can't read it often enough. Mm-hmm. But it's true in in our in our uh, in our in our relationships with our families, and particularly with our spouses, that we have to listen with respect. The other part I would say, just to simplify it, is that um, people in a marriage or relationship are never going to be the same. Their 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 relationship is going to change. It's going to evolve. People have different interests over time. They will change. The interests will change. So I think of, at least in in my relationship with my wife of 50 years, is we're like two trees. She's a tree. I'm a tree. I don't know what kind of tree, but some kind of tree. And our roots probably grow together a little bit. 
Our branches grow together a little bit up at the top, but she's her own tree. I am my own tree. Uh, if she feels she has to take off and go spend time with some friends, girlfriends, what have you on a trip or something, <laughs> let me know when you get there. It's totally fine. And I have the same, you know, arrangement uh, where uh, she respects my individuality with business. And I'm so fortunate, so fortunate uh, having had a successful career in businesses across all those industries you talked about. You can bet in a pre-digital world, there was a lot of travel, mm. lots of travel and lots of being gone to get stuff done. So um, she gave me that freedom and I give her the same freedom to do what she wants to do as and when she wants to do it. And we didn't have eight kids or 10 kids. We had two. So it was manageable, but we had support from, you know, parents, our parents, uh, grandparents to our kids. And we were just very, very fortunate that way. And I know not everybody always has that family infrastructure. Um, and it's, it's just one of the things that I count as a real blessing for me in my life that I had it. And it was part of my upbringing in terms of how I was raised. And now we're seeing that in terms of how our grandchildren are being raised. So in a loving and, and respectful way, and, and again, being good listeners. Mm. Love it. Greg, thank you very much. Um, shameless plug time. Uh, we can buy the book on Amazon. Where can we find you? Maybe share a website, how to contact you. Yeah. Uh, the book is available on Amazon, no lock doors, exclamation point. Uh, so it's Amazon, Kindle, Barnes and Noble. Uh, it was a bestseller in three categories when it came out, which was pretty mm -hmm. exciting. I didn't expect that to happen. Uh, the book uh, starts out as actually being a book of obligation. So uh, for your listeners who, who want to find out more about what the book, uh, what's behind the book, if you will, there's a great foreword uh, written by uh, the gentleman that enabled me to actually put the book together, asked me mm -hmm. to do it. And uh, we have a mentor-mentee relationship, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. And yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm easily found. My private company is Banco, B-A-N-C-O, Banco Advisors. Uh, we don't post a web page, but we are on LinkedIn. Awesome. Greg Smith, thank you for being here. Pleasure. Thank you, Josh. Have a great day. Thank you for watching another episode of Truth Seekers. We appreciate your interaction. So please comment, like, subscribe to YouTube. Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want more, check out some of our links. Links to our masterclass, The Achiever's Mindset, and come join our LinkedIn group. And what do you want to see more of? Remember, we're here to share the simple secrets of successful. So help us do that. What do you want to see? What do you want to see more of? Thanks, and see you again next time.